Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Moss. I'm the uh, director of the Optical Sciences Centre at uh, Swinburne University here in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm pleased today to talk about our work on graphene oxide for integrated photonic devices, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to give this uh, plenary presentation. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge our local and international collaborators. Um, the um, these are our uh, students and uh, research fellow Jiang Wu. Uh, this is a strong collaboration with uh, Professor Boha Jia, uh, who's just moved uh, to RMIT from Swinburne, uh, who's developed most of the graphene oxide technology. And my international collaborators, particularly the group in uh, France, uh, Christian Goyer and uh, Christelle Monet. So just a brief mention about our uh, center. It's uh, quite large, almost approaching 100 people. Um, we have one of the largest laser facilities uh, in Australia with uh, probably more than a dozen uh, mainframe femtosecond laser systems. We have nanofabrication, uh, a whole suite of things. Uh, Professor uh, Solius Uodkis is, is uh, the deputy director, as is uh, Christopher, Professor Chris Vale. Um, and, uh, and we have a strong effort in uh, biophotonics as well. I also just want to mention the Center for Translational Atom Materials, CTAM, which was formed uh, by Professor Gia, uh, who spun off from our center uh, about two years ago, and uh, their focus is on 2D materials and uh, chemistry. So this work is in strong collaboration with them. So just highlighting some of our equipment and facilities uh, in the Optical uh, Sciences Center, the mainframe lasers and nanofabrication and so on. This is a, an outline of my talk. I'll start off talking a bit about uh, the broad uh, background of graphene and graphene oxide in particular. Uh, I'll talk about our work on graphene oxide. Uh, we work on a broad range of applications. Um, and, uh, and then I'll focus on my particular group's uh, interest, which is uh, using graphene oxide for integrated nonlinear photonics. So our center and um, CTAM as well work uh, in a broad range of applications in graphene oxide um, from uh, nanophotonics, uh, solar energy uh, to uh, flexible energy storage devices, molecular filtering, uh, intelligent sensing, uh, all optical communications on, on a chip, um, uh, integrated uh, optoelectronic devices and integrated nonlinear photonics that I'm talking about uh, today. So just a summary of uh, some of our uh, papers from the last few years in uh, graphene oxide. Uh, this is BOHA's uh, Nature Photonics from 2019. Another highlight is our uh, advanced materials review from uh, last year, 2021, um, and uh, applied materials and interfaces. Uh, and uh, our original work back in uh, 2018 was an APL photonics paper with uh, BOHA demonstrating nonlinear optics and uh, graphene oxide coded waveguides. So I really don't need to uh, give much of an introduction to graphene to, uh, to this audience in particular, but uh, I just want to uh, highlight and summarize um, some of the remarkable properties of graphene that uh, includes uh, extremely high mobilities, uh, better than uh, almost any other material, uh, the strong quantum Hall effect even at room temperature, uh, the uh, remarkable optical properties uh, of, of graphene, uh, both linear and nonlinear. Um, the mechanical properties, tensile strengths, enormous tensile strengths, uh, thermal conductivity, which is higher than almost anything else on the planet at room temperature even, uh, and huge, huge uh, surface areas, which is fantastic for uh, surface chemistry and many other applications. So it's interesting to contrast uh, graphene oxide and, and graphene. Uh, obviously, graphene has attracted a huge amount of attention in recent years with the Nobel Prize in 2010, uh, spawning huge interest in, in whole families of new two-dimensional materials. Uh, but um, what's not probably commonly appreciated is that graphene oxide has actually been around for a long time. Uh, it was first reported in the mid-1800s, and it's probably known uh, long before that even. Uh, so it's been, it's been with us for quite a while. Um, the materials are, are very different, even though they both contain carbon lattices, obviously. Uh, graphene is a rigorous, uh, theoretical, you know, or, uh, rigorously two-dimensional material with amazing properties, theoretic band structure, whereas graphene oxide is much more complicated with functional groups, and this really gives it 
uh, more like a dielectric uh, behavior. So it's got a finite band gap, which can be tuned um, uh, by a variety of means. Uh, and so they're both, they're complementary, I would say, um, and uh, sort of two, two sides of the same, same coin. So this uh, just shows a summary, I guess, of all the different families of two-dimensional materials spanning the whole spectrum from the ultraviolet uh, all the way out to the far infrared uh, and even, even farther terahertz even uh, with the HBN, uh, hexagonal boron nitride, um, uh, a whole, whole families of uh, 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 diachalcogenides, um, uh, black phosphorus, uh, and graphene at the far end. So we can cover the, the, the complete spectrum, electromagnetic uh, spectrum. It's a very, very uh, exciting group of uh, materials. And one exciting, very exciting aspect to all of this is the ability to uh, stack uh, different fam families of materials together uh, to get uh, hetero junctions and hetero structures uh, to generate completely new types of materials with new uh, unprecedented properties. And so uh, it's just a, a, a hugely uh, interesting uh, sandbox or play box, I guess, <laughs> to play in. So this shows that the material properties are, of graphene oxide are hugely dependent on the uh, uh, functional uh, groups, uh, oxygen groups, and uh, this, these can be tailored uh, very much by uh, laser processing, and so we can vary the optical properties uh, quite dramatically. So two-dimensional uh, materials are really historically quite uh, notoriously difficult to work with. In fact, a lot of the laboratory uh, experiments, science uh, work on uh, graphene and other materials are based on just simple exfoliation uh, with uh, scotch tape and uh, uh, to get uh, the single um, layers, nano layers. Um, we are focused on uh, methods that are intrinsically scalable, reliable, and repeatable for large-scale uh, integration uh, for device fabrication and uh, the ability to process uh, single layers with uh, high um, high precision. And this is really uh, it's really a goal of the entire community is sort of focused on the, on these uh, key issues. So classic uh, pristine graphene in the um, honeycomb uh, lattice formation is really refers to a single monolayer. Uh, which um, has an optical absorption of 2.3%, uh, um, a very broad band across the whole spectrum. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, um, you know, there's a good uh, motivation to get to have multi-layer uh, graphene. Um, and uh, this, unfortunately, is extremely difficult to achieve without it just becoming an amorphous uh, mess, basically, of uh, uh, forming uh, graphite. Uh, so this is a, this is a major uh, challenge. So essentially what we'd like to have is a uh, basically a multi-layer metamaterial of graphene where each layer is a perfect um, uh, lattice, a monolayer lattice. Um, uh, and uh, But unfortunately, this is very difficult uh, to do, almost impossible um, with conventional methods. The CVD chemical vapor deposition requires specific substrates. And so the only way to uh, create this is to uh, transfer layer by layer uh, after depositing it by C CBD and the transfer process is just not uh, reliable or uh, doesn't work very well at all. So basically we uh, developed our own uh, approach that we call uh, multi-layer, uh, layer by layer uh, coating of um, graphene oxide films. And the idea is basically to use elect elect electrostatic uh, forces to um, bond the uh, different layers together and we use water soluble graphene oxide uh, and then sandwich in, in between layers of positively charged po polymer uh, and the negatively charged graphene oxide uh, forms a very tight bond and then we re uh, repeat this process and we're able to coat uh, very large areas uh, very uniformly with this uh, method. So in this way uh, we can uh, coat um, as I say, very large areas. Uh, this shows uh, uh, five uh, different layers. Uh, we've gone up to hundreds of, of layers uh, thick. Each one, including the polymer, is around three nanometers. So um, it's not actually monolayer like graphene is. That's a bit of a misnomer. Graphene oxide is actually quite thick because of the functional groups. But a key uh, property of this is that we can coat virtually any substrate at all. Uh, this is uh, four inch or six inch um, silicon wafers. Um, and even uh, curved surfaces as well, uh, lenses we've done, 
Uh, and so it's a very, very flexible and very powerful approach. And of course, uh, as well as large scale uh, coatings, we can uh, pattern this with photolithography to make very uh, small coatings as well. We've gone down to a few microns squared using sort of lift off techniques. So this uh, uh, method is extremely powerful and uh, very, very uh, flexible. We can even generate freestanding uh, films this way. Um, this is, uh, shows a freestanding graphene oxide film sandwich between polymers. It's very rugged. Um, we can, uh, in this way, create an arbitrary number of layers to tailor the optical properties, the absorption, the surface roughness, and uniformity. Surface roughness is very extremely low. Uniformity is very high. Um, and probably most importantly is that um, it's very conformal. So this shows a conformal coating of um, nanopillar arrays, which is basically impossible to do with uh, graphene. Uh, whereas here we get this conformal coating. Uh, the same uh, is applies to say nanowires and waveguides. We can conformally coat that. Um, so it's extremely uh, flexible technique. So this shows the optical uh, properties measured by uh, FTIR or Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy uh, across the entire range from the UV to the uh, mid infrared, showing a very long, large range where the absorption is uh, quite low over the uh, uh, visible to the uh, infrared and uh, with a, also a very high refractive index. So that uh, makes it uh, useful for, for optical uh, devices. Uh, laser uh, processing of 2D materials is very um, uh, common and uh, broad-based technique. Um, with graphene oxide, it's particularly powerful uh, because we can uh, generate very high purity and very high quality um, graphene from graphene oxide by photoreducing it to get rid of all the functional groups. And um, uh, as they say, we can not only create the graphene uh, but through this method, but also pattern it uh, with high resolution patterning. Um, another uh, benefit to this is that um, we can um, uh, can uh, obviously create uh, contacts. Um, we can start with a number of uh, different precursors. In this case, it's not uh, graphene oxide, but uh, nickel carbide or nickel carbon. Um, we can uh, uh, also do uh, layer laser-based uh, thinning of 2D materials, and this works layer by layer because the thermal conductivity in plane is much much higher than uh, out of plane, and so uh, it, it's uh, possible to do single monolayer uh, uh, thinning uh, with this method. Um, we can also do doping uh, by uh, doing the laser reduction in an, in a, uh, an atmosphere to uh, incorporate uh, different dopants to form lateral uh, VN junctions. Uh, and all of this is really quite compatible with uh, large scale uh, integration. So very powerful methods uh, here. So now having uh, generated these multiple uh, layers of graphene oxide sandwiched by polymers, uh, a key method that we've developed is femtosecond laser reduction where we photoreduce the layers uh, where the layer the laser uh, eliminates the uh, oxygen uh, functional groups and converts the graphene oxide to graphene so we can generate a metamaterial multiple layer uh, lattice of graphene oxide or sorry graphene and um, this shows the uh, progression the reduction in the band gap as we uh, with uh, the exposure the fluence of the laser showing the band gap uh, reducing from around 2.2 eV to start to in this case, it's not quite zero, but it's close, and we have actually generated a very uh, um, small band gap, uh, essentially pure graphene material. This shows the, uh, the properties of um, the conductivity compared with uh, CVD uh, films, showing that our films are very high quality, and so we have this ability to photo pattern uh, and generate uh, very high quality graphene oxide films this way. So one of the really important uh, aspects of this is that we can actually get very fine grayscale uh, control so we can continuously tune the uh, linear optical properties just by adjusting the, uh, the, um, the exposure level and so we can get uh, very uh, nice control over the uh, linear refractive uh, index and uh, absorption this way. And this just shows a um, Q code uh, patterned uh, with our uh, laser uh, that points to our uh, website. One of the uh, main methods that we have is we find very powerful to produce graphene uh, is uh, from graphene oxide by using uh, laser photoreduction. So this shows a uh, laser patterning, if you like, of a graphene oxide film, which is water soluble. Uh, and uh, when we write it, it actually produces layers of uh, graphene. 
from that that we can actually use for uh, to create contacts for for uh, you know solar cells and supercapacitors and so on. So this uh, actually shows the writing taking place. Um, and uh, of course, one of the big advantages is to, to get high resolution, very fine patterning of uh, contacts uh, for integrated circuit devices. And the quality of the graphene that's produced this way is extremely high. So it's a very, very uh, powerful method. So one of our big uh, applications is uh, ultra thin uh, Fresnel lenses, essentially, where we um, pattern 200 nanometer thick layers of graphene oxide uh, and uh, photo re reduce it to change the refractive index, not all the way to graphene because uh, that absorbs, but just vary the refractive index and we can get extremely high quality uh, focusing out of this down to the diffraction limit um, and uh, with uh, lenses that uh, you know weigh on, on the order of milligrams. So extremely uh, powerful and valuable for things like uh, space applications and, uh, and so on. It's a very nice uh, technique. So one very powerful uh, aspect of this is the fact that um, because the graphene oxide films are stretchable and tunable, we can actually make uh, variable uh, focal length lenses this way that are extremely uh, flat. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at uh, conventional zoom lenses, they're very bulky and kind of clumsy in your iPhone. Uh, you know, they may seem small, but they're actually quite uh, large. In this way, we can have um, an ultra flat, 200 nanometer thick um, lens that is uh, uh, that is tunable to make a zoom lens. So this just shows some uh, theoretical simulations showing that uh, with about a 10% stretch in uh, the um, the film, the lens, so we can get a substantial uh, change in the uh, focal spot uh, depth. So here we have some experimental results where we've got um, two different uh, letters uh, imprinted on different um, films, uh, 170 nanometers apart, and uh, by changing the uh, imaging it with the um, graphene oxide lens and changing the focal length, by uh, only about 4%, 4 to 5 percent, we can uh, change the focal spot uh, from the uh, F to the E uh, letter, and uh, this shows the blue, green, and red, so the uh, very large spectral range because of the flat, um, very flat uh, refractive index. So uh, it's extremely attractive uh, way of doing this. The number of uh, things you can do with this technique is almost unlimited, really. It's, uh, this shows the formation of graphene oxide bubble lenses uh, by, uh, uh, through successive laser exposure. Um, this shows the interference fringes as you're forming the, the bubble, um, and uh, this uh, over here is, um, shows the, um, uh, the bubble formation and the lens formation. So this is really good for uh, on-ship uh, lens uh, fabrication for coupling into devices, and uh, this again shows the uh, formation of the, um, of the lens here, uh, bubble lens. Um, and. Um, so a very powerful technique. This technique is uh, not just limited to graphene oxide, actually. it's um, We've uh, tried it with uh, TMDCs. This is uh, tungsten diselenide, and uh, uh, by ablating uh, areas to make a ultra-flat uh, Fresnel lens, we've come up, we've made, uh, demonstrated the world's flattest uh, lens, or, or rather, um, uh, yeah, which is uh, 6.7 angstroms thick, so a world record. So a notoriously uh, challenging problem uh, is coupling light from optical fibers into photonic chips because the mode sizes are very different and so a very common technique is to use lens uh, tapered uh, fibers and uh, this is quite a tricky technique but uh, with our graphene oxide uh, ultra thin lens we can uh, just coat it with uh, gra uh, graphene oxide pattern it with, into a Fresnel lens so we can get very good coupling efficiency this way. So this just uh, shows some of our experimental results of coupling uh, light into nanowires, uh, silicon nanowires that are uh, in hundreds of nanometers or um, uh, in dimension uh, from optical fibers, which are uh, microns in, in dimension. So this uh, shows some experimental and theoretical results. This is the uh, theory and this is the uh, experimental results showing three-dimensional uh, focusing of light uh, to extremely uh, small dimensions. So we get very high numerical apertures out of these lenses. So it's not just the fact that they're small yeah, easy to make, uh, compact and flat, but uh, the performance is extremely high as well, getting a very high NAs out of this. So another uh, uh, interesting application is um, freestanding uh, polarizers, and uh, uh, the nice thing about graphene oxide is that it works uh, well into the mid-infrared, and uh, polarizers in the mid-infrared are 
quite difficult to achieve with uh, high performance. And this shows a um, uh, experimental uh, polarizer made by patterning uh, these grating structures, uh, which gives very anisotropic absorption for the polarization. Uh, and we can achieve uh, greater than 20 dB um, uh, differential absorption between these polarizations and with uh, films that are many, many uh, centimeters uh, in. So um, one uh, interesting application is uh, broadband uh, spectrometers. And so with these grading structures, we've been able to make some very attractive uh, spectrometers for many applications, uh, fiber-based uh, for astrophysics, uh, for endoscopes, and, and so on. It's very, very attractive. So as I mentioned before, uh, an important aspect of these uh, graphene oxide films is their ability to get very, very good uh, conformal coating. So this shows some nanowires uh, where we get very uniform, uh, tight conformal coating, which is almost impossible to get with uh, normal conventional uh, two-dimensional two material uh, deposition. So uh, another uh, really important aspect of this uh, material is the resilience or ruggedness, I guess. And we've done a lot of uh, very severe uh, environmental testing uh, for aerospace applications and both in chemical and biological environments. And this material is extremely uh, ro robust and resilient uh, and reliable, I guess, long lived. So that's uh, very important. So this is the uh, probably the main topic of my talk, which is uh, graphene oxide uh, films to enhance the nonlinear optical performance of uh, photonic integrated uh, chips. So for this part of the talk, I'll give a brief introduction to integrated nonlinear optics uh, and then talk about the nonlinear optical properties of graphene oxide and then uh, some of the results that we've uh, been publishing in the last uh, few years. So the ever uh, increasing demand for uh, data capacity and processing speed is one of the drivers for uh, nonlinear optics uh, because the intrinsic Speed uh, is almost unlimited with, uh, with nonlinear optical processes. So, uh, in integrated photonic chips is the way to, to do this most effectively. Um, there's a number of um, aspects to this uh, RF photonics, radio frequency and microwave photonics, uh, quantum optics has become quite uh, big. Uh, nonlinear optics, uh, particularly microcombs, and uh, optical communications is uh, one of the big drivers. So integrated electronic chips and uh, photonic chips both have their advantages. And uh, uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, silicon optoelectronic uh, chips uh, become mainstream in telecommunications, uh, mostly for sort of linear processing. Um, and uh, so they're really um, commercial devices at this stage. Um, our angle here is to move beyond this into nonlinear photonic chips. So nonlinear uh, optical, all optical signal processing has been around for quite a long time, more than 20 years in the research community. Um, and as uh, many, many functions have been demonstrated uh, at ultra fast speeds. Uh, this is one of the attractions for all optical processing is that it's in principle almost unlimited in, in, in speed. You can get up into the terabit per second regime, but uh, to date it really hasn't entered the um, commercial systems in, in a major way. Um, we're hoping that some uh, applications, particularly things like frequency combs and microcombs, will, uh, will, will do that. And so one of the goals is to uh, replace as much of the main bulk uh, rack-mounted equipment as possible with these um, compact, uh, ultra-fast uh, photonic chips. So basically, I'm going to introduce uh, nonlinear optics in one slide here. Um, so this is the um, uh, expression for the, nonlinear, for the polarization. Um, and uh, uh, as a function of the linear electric field and then uh, the nonlinear terms here, um, this is obviously large. These are very, very small. So typically you require, you know, uh, kilowatts or even megawatts of power to see these effects. Um, the second order effect is uh, zero in most centrosymmetric materials. And so for things like silicon and silica, we end up having to work with the third order term. Um, and which is much more common. Uh, and the third order term can generate many different processes, um, such as four wave mixing to shift frequencies, third harmonic generation to triple frequencies. Um, and a very common one for signal processing is the Kerr effect or the intensity dependent refractive index. So this is where the uh, intensity of the light affects uh, it, the refractive index that it feels itself. So. Uh, this is used for many uh, ultra high speed uh, signal processing functions and the intrinsic speed of these effects is uh, virtually uh, uh, instantaneous. So this uh, just shows uh, again uh, these processes that are 
Uh, very commonly used in uh, signal processing. I guess the most, some of the most common ones are SPM cell phase modulation, XPM cross phase modulation, where the light affects the optical phase, and you can use that to uh, create switching devices and a whole variety of things. So one of the key uh, approaches to make these devices practical to be able to work at uh, uh, milliwatts instead of megawatts of power is to use nanophotonics to shrink the size down so that um, uh, you can still get very high intensities with very low uh, absolute uh, power. Uh, so nanophotonics lets you enhance the intensity uh, by uh, shrinking down the dimensions to sort of nano, uh, hundreds of nanometers and also also potentially using things like slow light to uh, boost the intensity as well um, with huge uh, enhancement factors. This is just one example of uh, signal processing using uh, four-way mixing to do demultiplexing, if you like. Um, so this is where uh, you use a pump to uh, uh, demultiplex a uh, signal here. And so uh, both of these pulses here generate a new frequency through four-way mixing. And you can filter this frequency out with an optical filter. And so you don't need any high-speed equipment to do that. Just by optically filtering this, you can basically have an ultra-high-speed uh, demultiplexer. Um, this just shows the range of different... Uh, uh, types of photonic chips uh, for nonlinear optics um, and diff the different processes involved. Optical microcomb generation has, has become a huge field in the, in the last uh, 10 years, and we're very uh, active in this. So a fundamental uh, issue with uh, the current nonlinearity, which was realized by a friend of mine, uh, Victor Mizrahi, back in the uh, 1980s, is that uh, the fact that the um, uh, intensity-dependent uh, refractive index is accompanied by an intensity-dependent absorption. And because these scale the same way with intensity, um, what happens is you increase the intensity to increase your refractive index change for these devices, you increase the, the absorption in proportion. And so it's a self-limiting effect. And so it's the ratio of these two that's the <clears throat> uh, term, the nonlinear figure of merit. And this has to be high, generally more than one, to make uh, efficient devices. And this is a key, key issue with uh, nonlinear devices. So as I say, in the last uh, 10 years or so, silicon photonics chips have uh, become mainstream in the telecom industry for uh, sort of linear optical interconnects and, and uh, you know, uh, linear functions. Um, it's, they're CMOS compatible, uh, many, many uh, advantages, uh, advanced fabrication techniques and so on, uh, low loss in the telecom band at 15, 15 nanometers um, and so on. And even for nonlinear optics, uh, which is more uh, research focused, I guess, um, it has very high nonlinearity, and uh, which enables uh, efficient devices and uh, high index contrast and low linear loss as well. Uh, there's only one really big problem for silicon for nonlinear optics, and that is that uh, in the telecom band, at least at 15, 15 nanometers. Uh, the two-photon absorption um, is very, it's quite high. Um, it's because the indirect band gap here is about one electron volt, and so the two-photon energy at 1550 is above this, and so you can get quite a lot of uh, nonlinear absorption. So its figure of merit is only around 0.3, which is not very good for nonlinear signal processing. This was demonstrated quite dramatically in 2010 when um, they move by moving to slightly longer wavelengths, so below the uh, two-photon band gap here, so near two microns out of the telecom band, uh, they managed to get very high parametric gain, uh, whereas before in the telecom band, um, it was limited to about 2 dB. Here, they're getting 50 and 60 dB. So um, two-photon absorption is a, is, a, is a showstopper, really, for silicon, uh, for nonlinear optics in the telecom band. And that's why we're interested in graphene oxide as a way of getting around this. So around 2007 or so, 2008, uh, people started realizing that silicon was a real problem for nonlinear optics in the telecom band. Uh, even though it has very large nonlinearity, its two-photon absorption is just too high to make it uh, useful. Uh, and so um, people started looking at other platforms, uh, including silicon nitride and uh, this platform that we've been working on called Hydex, which is very similar to silicon oxynitride, if you like. Um, these have almost no nonlinear absorption because the band gap is very high. Um, and so they're great, have a lot of great properties. The only uh, drawback to these is that the nonlinearity is much weaker than, about 100 times weaker than 
uh, silicon. And so you really uh, want to complement these basic platforms with highly nonlinear materials like graphene oxide, which is what we've been uh, doing in the last few years. So this just uh, summarizes those ideas um, that we want to uh, combine the good properties of the basic platforms, silicon nitride and, and Hydex, with uh, the uh, high nonlinearity and other properties of uh, novel materials such as graphene oxide to produce hybrid devices that offer the best of uh, both worlds. So we're not the only uh, people working in this area. Uh, 2D materials have been uh, used for a wide range of uh, linear and nonlinear uh, optical properties from signal generation, uh, polarization, selection, uh, mode locking, parametric amplification, and all optical modulation. So graphene oxide has a lot of really attractive uh, properties for linear and nonlinear optics. Uh, it has a, a very high uh, current nonlinearity, uh, maybe three to four orders of magnitude larger even than silicon. Uh, low linear loss uh, compared to other 2D materials such as graphene, maybe two to three orders of magnitude less. Uh, low two photon absorption, so we're getting uh, high figures of merit in the telecom band. Um, uh, we have developed uh, easy methods and uh, uh, for preparation of uh, films, and uh, its uh, two its material properties, both linear and nonlinear, are tunable by a variety of means, including laser photo reduction. Um, and finally, it has uh, some interesting anisotropic uh, properties that uh, give us more flexibility for polarization sensitive devices. So this shows uh, some of the highlights of our work in the last few years um, in graphene oxide for nonlinear optics. And uh, I guess one of the highlights is this uh, advanced materials review uh, last year, 2021. So this just uh, contrasts some of the uh, linear and nonlinear optical properties of uh, graphene with graphene oxide, and uh, we can see that the, uh, as I said, the uh, even though the current nonlinearity is uh, weaker in Go, it's still very strong. It's uh, uh, two to three orders of magnitude stronger than silicon. Um, but uh, most importantly, its linear loss is orders of magnitude lower than graphene oxide, so it makes it feasible to make longer waveguides. And also, uh, because its band gap is much higher than graphene oxide, uh, its two-photon absorption is also much, much lower than graphene. Oxide, graphene. So uh, a very uh, powerful material. So the other uh, really powerful property of uh, graphene oxide is the ability to photo-tune uh, its properties, uh, both linear and nonlinear. This is a paper we published um, uh, about, I think, 2015 on looking at the nonlinear properties, the N2 Kerr coefficient and uh, two photon absorption coefficient with uh, fluence, laser fluence exposure. Uh, and you can see that the uh, we can tune the uh, nonlinearity even uh, through zero and, and from positive to negative. So it gives us tremendous uh, flexibility. And we can also increase, dramatically increase the figure of merit doing uh, this uh, method as well. So as I mentioned before, we have this very uh, powerful uh, method of uh, producing a uh, large area of high quality uh, graphene oxide films uh, layer by layer, and uh, so we use this method to coat uh, to various devices, and then we pattern it and, and or do liftoff sort of approaches to, to make uh, integrated devices. Um, so uh, we've done this with uh, a number of different platforms with silicon, uh, silicon on insulator. Uh, this shows the different processing steps and the, the ability to do conformal coating on these uh, nanowires is very important uh, for, for this. Um, uh, we've also looked at uh, the Hydex waveguides, where we generally uh, do uniform coating on the, on the surface, uh, in a planarized surface, uh, because these are lower index contrast waveguides, uh, and also silicon nitride, which is uh, maybe a bit more similar to silicon here, but uh, um, we've also uh, coated uh, devices uh, silicon nitride and looked at uh, the enhanced nonlinear performance there as well. So we've looked at uh, not only waveguides, but uh, ring resonators as well. We've coated uh, ring resonators with uh, graphene oxide films uh, to look at uh, the polarization properties and uh, the enhanced nonlinear optics. So this shows some of our most exciting results with uh, graphene oxide uh, in uh, silicon on insulator and nanowires, looking at the uh, SPM cell phase modulation broadening of the pulses as we ramp up the uh, intensity. And we've looked at the effect of the uh, thickness, the number of layers on the nonlinear response. And we find that uh, um, the uh, nonlinear figure of merit can actually increase quite dramatically in the waveguide silicon, as you remember, is uh, 0.3. And uh, we're improving that now by a factor of uh, 20 times higher 
by coating it with uh, graphene oxide. So uh, it's a very uh, promising results. So these are some results from 2020 where we looked at the effect of um, patterning with uh, graphene oxide on silicon nitride waveguides and we showed uh, an improvement of almost uh, 10 dB by um, coating with uh, graphene oxide and uh, we looked at the effect of uh, the number of layers, the length of the patterning uh, um, of the go patterning and, uh, and other parameters as well. And so the four-way mixing conversion efficiency to uh, different uh, wavelengths uh, is an important um, uh, functionality. And this uh, just shows some of our initial work in this area of 2017 paper, Applied Physics Letters Photonics, where we demonstrated uh, an improvement in uh, the four-way mixing efficiency in high-dex uh, coated waveguides with graphene oxide of uh, up to uh, about 7 uh, dB, and we've done uh, much better than that since then. And uh, we've also demonstrated uh, enhanced four-way mixing in uh, uh, graphene oxide coated uh, micro ring resonators where we just coat a small area of it with uh, graphene oxide and uh, uh, show an improvement in the four wave mixing efficiency um, and uh, achieved uh, again around uh, about 10 dB enhancement in the four wave mixing efficiency depending on the uh, device uh, parameters. And uh, finally, just highlighting some results we got uh, from about three years ago now. Uh, on uh, integrated polarizers uh, using graphene oxide waveguides in uh, uh, end ring resonators um, by coating with uh, graphene oxide and taking advantage of the anisotropic uh, optical properties of that material. Um, so we managed to uh, achieve uh, polarization selective devices with um, differential um, transmission or polarization selectivity uh, more than uh, 50 dB uh, in these materials. Um, so it's, um, it's something that's very difficult to do um, in uh, waveguides. Uh, so it's very uh, exciting work. So just uh, concluding the um, nonlinear optics uh, part of my talk, um, the, um, we demonstrated enhanced nonlinear optics uh, in uh, waveguides in the th uh, three different platforms, silicon, silicon nitride, and hydex. Uh, both in waveguides and ring resonators. I think probably some of our most exciting work is the fact that uh, by simply coating with graphene oxide uh, with uh, on silicon devices, we can enhance the nonlinear figure of merit by up to 20 times, which is a huge issue for uh, for silicon. So that's that's quite interesting. Uh, and generally speaking, we get a, we see a, enhancements in the uh, Nonlinear conversion efficiency of around uh, sort of the 10 to 15 dB mark, uh, depending on the layer thickness and uh, length and so on and so forth. And we've done it both in waveguides and uh, and ring resonators. So to conclude, um, graphene oxide is a very interesting, very powerful, flexible material with uh, unprecedented functionality for photonics, both for bulk optical devices and uh, integrated photonic chips. Uh, with this uh, tunable linear and nonlinear optical properties uh, offers huge potential. Uh, and this is just uh, early days. It's just the beginning of this work. So this uh, shows most of my group, at least anyway. Um, this is um, uh, Yang Xu, who's uh, done a lot of work in the uh, graphene oxide. Unfortunately, uh, Nicole, or uh, Yuning Zhang, uh, is not in the picture because she was stranded in uh, China at the time and was over there for quite a while. Actually, she's back now, but, um, uh, and these are some of my other students, uh, Xing Wen Zhu and uh, Meng Shi Tan, who have been uh, doing a lot of work in the microwave. Uh, my collaborators, Professor Arna Mitchell and uh, Bill Corcoran, and this is uh, Professor Bo Hua Ji, has developed a lot of the uh, graphene oxide uh, capability that we're uh, collaborating on now. And uh, my postdoc, uh, Ji Yang Wu, who's been instrumental in, uh, in on all of this work and uh, myself, uh, Professor uh, Dave Moss. So thanks uh, very much for uh, watching my talk. It's uh, covered quite a broad range of material, uh, but I hope you've got a sense of uh, the uh, really, really exciting properties that uh, graphene oxide uh, has and its potential for a wide range of applications for both linear and nonlinear photonics. So uh, uh, thanks very much again. That is the plenary talk from Dr. David Moss. Since he's un unavailable,
in this webinar. If you have any questions, please write to our conference manager.